1,400 years ago, a bunch of pagan, warlike foreigners turned up in this area and they never went home again. Who were they and where are they now? doesn't look much like an ancient site, does it? It looks more like a building site, which is what it actually is, or at least it would be if the owner was allowed to develop it. But he's been told there may be bodies under the ground here, ancient bodies. And he's not allowed to actually build until all the archaeology has been sorted out. But he can't afford to pay for the archaeology. We're in the village of Winterbourne Gunner near Salisbury in Wiltshire where these newly built houses lie on top of a 6th century Saxon graveyard. We've got three days to find any new graves which may lie under all the rubble so the developer can get on and build. So where the heck do we start in a place like this, Mick? I don't know, it's covered in rubble, isn't it? <laughs> really, it's a case of you know, bringing the machine in and, and taking all the rubble off the top and, and having a look what's what's there. Are we allowed to knock this sort of thing down? I think we've probably got to get rid of the shed uh, <laughs> in order to get the machine in and to get a big enough area and a lot of these piles of rubble and so on will have to be uh, moved as well. Why don't we do a bit of geophysics? Wouldn't that be easier? Well, the trouble is the ground is absolutely full of, of rubble and, and modern rubbish, you know, particularly metal. I mean, you know, you've got bits of metal and corrugated iron and pipes and that's going to throw a lot of the signals out. So... If we're going to find these stiffs, what do we do first? I think we've got to bring the machine in and, and, and get rid of the topsoil and get cracking on it. OK. No one knows just how big the Saxon graveyard is, so we can try and answer that question too. At the back of the site, there's a strip of open ground that's never been built on. Here may be the best opportunity to define how far the graveyard spreads. Carenza's team gets started straight away. I mean, what we're really trying to do here, one of the most, most important things we've got to do is define the extent of the site. Mm -hmm. We know there are graves over there just under the houses, mm -hmm. but we don't know what's here at all. Are there any geophysical techniques you can do here? to pick up graves in this area if they're there. We, we, we could try resistivity, um, but there's a lot of structures in the way which we're not going to get through, like uh, the concrete. And if, even if we try to move the vehicles, we're not going to get true responses because of the moisture variation. Mm. We'll give it a try in the region that we can. So it's sort of a long shot. It's a long shot. You might be able to pick stuff up. OK, well, if you start getting set out, we'll come and survey you in so we can put it okay. on the map. Nice. Um, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <Need it. laughs> Back at the site, the rubbish has been cleared and we can start stripping back the topsoil. By now, the developer, David Buckland, has turned up to watch what we're doing. What do, do we know, David? Is there any services through here? Any water? You know, gas, electricity, anything like that? I think that pipe just down there is part of the old water main that used to run right up through the site. Um, and there's an electricity cable that runs round the back. But apart from that, I don't know anything... So we're all right over this side, well, I think, uh, so, yeah. Front, yeah. yeah, I think... Mick, how do you know how deep you can dig without messing anything up? Well, what we've done here is just take the topsoil off, as you can see, scrape that back, and you've come straight down onto the chalk, which is the natural geology. So all we're doing is just coming down onto that, and then any features cut into that show up as dark lines. So that, for example, here, you can see there's a, a line across there. Where's the other one, Phil? Is it this one here? I thought this was just done by the digger, but it's... No, it's, it's not. I mean, there's, there's two lines, you see, and we think they're probably... Um, Oh, this one here? It's probably medieval ploughing, something like that, yeah. But that's cut into the chalk, you see. Have yeah. a look at this. Hang 
know, let's, uh, and so obviously any grave will show up in the same way as just soil-filled hole. So how will you know when you found something like a grave? Well, I think there's something we got back there which could well be uh, the edge of a grave. We've only got just the slightest corner of it. But now, why do you think there's a grave there? It looks just well, like every other area. Yes, to me. right. But what we've got is here. We've got the very, very nice chalk, solid chalk. You can see that's very, very white. Yeah. And then, just in this corner, you see that's a soily patch. And here, look, just a bit of charcoal. Now that's not, that's not in the chalk. That's that's an artificial thing. Uh, so show me where you think roughly the outside edge of the, the outside grave edge of the of the grave would come round there, and round there, and it's heading off that direction. This, this, this direction, yeah. Well, I can't see it. We'll just have to wait and that's see. Very, very white. Yeah. Stuart, I've got some more archaeological information here. I'm hoping we might be able to build up a sort of bigger picture, not just of the cemetery, but the sort of settlement and anything else that was going on in the landscape. That's right. There's actually a lot of information around here. Meanwhile, Carenza's gathering information from all previous archaeology in the area, like the location of all other known graves under the next door houses, this prehistoric burial mound surrounded by a ring ditch in the field next door and medieval village remains found near the village church. It'd be amazing if we could locate the settlement where the Saxons had lived before they were buried. That's, uh, that's very clear now. I can see the sides very clearly now, look, Phil, that's down right. like that, either that's side. And a nice, sh sharp nice edge. return on this end. Yeah, and I'm standing right on that's the end right. this end. It's even slightly wider this that's end. That's right, look. yeah. So presumably the head's this end, and the feet going off down yeah. there. With the first yes. grave revealed, I took the opportunity of asking David how he got into this mess. When the chap in the middle started building, they discovered all these graves. And of course, you know, um, the next thing is I get loads and loads of mail telling me that I can't do anything at all because of the graves that they've discovered on the site. And the next thing after that is that I get a bill um, for the cost of the excavation and apart from the fact that I owe the bank about twice as much as the ground is worth, the bill for the excavation is also almost the amount that the ground is worth. So, so you're snowed under with this massive debt, yep. and you can't sell your land even at a loss nope. to pay it off, because they say... And now they're asking me for a bill as well. How's that affected you personally? Um, well, I used to have a little bit more hair. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't done my marriage too much good, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, I've had four years of worry, really. Well, well this one still looks good. Phil caught up with local archaeologist yeah, Pete Cox, who'd excavated yeah, lots of the graves under the houses there. next door. Um, we've got no problem about other graves cutting into it, so it's just really a question of starting the process of, you know, layer by layer, yeah. taking it off. And I suppose the other thing we've got to be careful of is grave goods. Yeah, that's right. They're, they're going to occur sporadically. Uh, some of the graves are completely plain. Um, others have have brooches and, and things from where they've you know they've worn you know from shoals or whatever around right. their shoulders. It's one of the key things really. The, oh, wow. the, 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 the <laughs> bones are, are very important because you know we're dealing with real people at last in archaeology. Uh, but the objects with them are, are important because they're they're datable right. and, they, and they tell you about something about the community. Well, let's hope we uh, can get some then. Yep. Right, should we leave Mick to get on with that? You happy there then, Mick? Oh, we've got some spectators we have, here. We? Well, obviously, when we get into exposing the skeleton, we're going to have to block off the, the entrance to the site and actually sort of stop visibility. That's the uh, home office again, is it? That's right, that's part Good of the... Home the office. Part, <laughs> part of the, 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 the licence. Bureaucratic yeah. rules. Yeah. <laughs> so who were these Saxons and why did they come here? Well, when the Roman Empire collapsed, it was a bit like the collapse of the Russian Empire in our lifetime. Immediately, blood feuds started and there were civil wars. And you'd imagine that maybe there was some local tribe chief around here who was dying to have a dust-up with another local tribe chief. So what did he do? He did what the Romans always did in situations like this. He called in mercenaries from Northern Europe, the Saxons. And they were dying to come here for two reasons. Firstly, because the sea level was rising, so their pastures were getting flooded. 
and secondly because their own country was being invaded by warlike tribes from all across Europe. So they came here, they did the job, and then they decided they weren't going home again, whatever the local people thought. A bit like the Russians in Latvia and Lithuania nowadays. Well, at least, that's my current theory. And we've got three days to find out whether or not there might be some truth in it. Robin, if we find any Saxon bodies, do you reckon they would have been mercenaries? Well, we've only got one uh, contemporary account of what was happening at around uh, the, kind, the time that we're talking about. Uh, a testy old cleric called Gildas uh, states uh, that uh, the Saxons were invited in by the British to help defend them against nasty attacks from the Picts and the Scots up north. So I'm right. Well, not necessarily. You see, we have uh, a much later account, 9th century, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which tells us chapter and verse for the Saxon invasion as it moved north from the Hampshire coast. Uh, they move inland, uh, achieve a, a substantial victory in 519, uh, and finally win the Battle of Salisbury in 552. And they were Saxons? And they were Saxons. So could these dead Saxons have been killed in one of these big set-piece battles? They're earlier than that, round about 520. Uh, and not only that, but they include graves of women and children. It's a settlement cemetery, uh, possibly at a time when the Saxons were living relatively at peace under or with the Romano-British. So they could be colonists, uh, and they could be mercenaries, or they could be an invading army. Hello, we're from <laughs> Time Team on the television. I wonder if you mind if we went on your balcony to have a view over the site that we're digging. It would be quite useful to us. Yes. Would you sure. mind? That's, that's very kind. Should we of take it. our boots off, Mick? Yeah, I think we better. Mick and Carenza are doing a survey of the surrounding land and looking for a high vantage point. Oh, that's great. Will this do? That's lovely. That's wonderful. Thanks, thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see you've got your holy sock on. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a much better view, isn't it? There's the site, look, beyond that uh, green field, beyond the hedge. Yeah, that's the caravans that are causing the geophysicists' right, grief, isn't right. it? Right, right. If the cemetery's up on the top there, we might expect the settlement to be down towards the river, actually, more or less, where the church is, down there. Well, uh, actually, actually, there are some earthworks just around in that, that ah, field right. in the church, um, and mm. they've even been excavated as well. Well, there's been a few trenches put across them about 30 years so ago. So we might, we might be able to find the finds for that as well. Yeah, they're in the yeah. museum, they're coming tomorrow. But they're not likely to be Saxon, are they? They're more likely to be, what, medieval village earth? They look like it. Like... It's a pity we can't see much in the way of um, crop marks in the field where all these barrows are supposed to have been. Um, and there's that very good one we saw on the air photo. Have you seen this? Um, that mark there, we're, um, we're up here. Yeah. Um, you've seen that, that oh, one that's, there? That's, that's, that's almost too good to be true, isn't it? It is. I mean, it really does. Could these prehistoric burial mounds or barrows that show up as crop rings be some sort of clue to our site? The locals have known about them for years. So where were these rings that sometimes become visible? Well, they kept, came over in the far corner there. In the next just field. over the other side of this hedge? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what sort of things were but, they then? Well, it is just like the soil just dried right out, you know, and it left in the, the crops. It just left a complete circle. A dry, How big? dead. Oh, you can take it, I suppose, if you take quite, the circle. Quite a circle. From there, if you quite, take from the hedge here, yeah. from this hedge here across to that fence there, yeah. crossways, and that's the size of the circle round. 20, 30 feet, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any idea what it might have been? No, no I don't think anybody's no, ever no, bothered, have they? No. Not, uh, Meanwhile, the geophysics team struggle to get a reading among all the discarded rubbish. This site is a mess, isn't it? Yes, it is. Why can't David develop it? The principal reason is that there is a condition on the planning application saying that he has to carry out an excavation before he develops the site. And you slept that condition on? Uh, I advise the District Council that that should be put on, yes. Why? Um, in 1960, ten graves were discovered on that side of the fence, and in 1992, there were 23 graves found on that side. Um, and I naturally assume that the Anglo-Saxon cemetery that these both relate to um, continues through the middle here, and therefore it's a very important site and needs to be excavated before development takes place. But in the meantime, David's been going bankrupt. 
I, I understand that this is the case. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing personally that I can do about that. But excavating is going to be very expensive, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is, yes. So why yes. can't you pay for that? Because he hasn't got any money. I'm afraid we don't have any money either. Um, being part of local government, um, we don't have that sort of funds available. Nick, now? Yeah. Well, let's see what we can do. We're already a long way towards solving David's problem. Yeah. It's got to be somewhere it's here. It's got to be in that sort of area, unless it's the other end, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got the first skull. Oh, yeah. oh excellent. That's brilliant. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, look, it's just coming out round there and it cleans it up a bit. Well, that looks pretty conclusive, doesn't it? Has it got a big crack in it? That's fantastic. Well, like uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you'd had, a, if you'd had a <laughs> JCB running backwards and forwards over the top. Well, there you are. A first for time team, our first skull. Stay with us for the next bit and we might even find out how it died. the beginning of day two. This place has changed a bit in the last 24 hours, hasn't it? The amazing news is that where we expected to find at least a dozen graves, we only turned up three. Come look at this one over here. As this one's... Uh, oh, a second dunes. skull. So that's, that's in much better condition. Wow. So you can actually see the head is turned facing this way, so the eye sockets are going to be in there, you see. Yeah. This is an interesting one, this, because it's a, it's a very special grave that they've marked with boulders. Quite why, we probably won't know till we've gone down a bit further. We're sort of working on the idea at the moment that there's less burials in this area because there's something going on here rather than graves. What the, Would it be, like a, a shrine or something like well, that? Well, that's a possibility. I mean, it, it, it might be a building that's a shrine, or it could be, just for example, a big tree or, or a pit. This feature behind us, this great brown area, which ought to be chalk and isn't, it might be a big hole in which stuff has been washed, or it may be a, the remains of a barrow around which all this cemetery was laid. So it looks as though the crowd of bodies gradually gets less yeah. as we get to this circle To whatever here. this is in the oh, middle. Square here. Oh, hang on. Our third grave is obviously shallower than we thought. Oh, just, just we are the, the skull. God, there. blimey, that's lucky because that's I a modern see post, it. isn't it? Can you not well, look, see at, it? look at this, Tony. There's a modern post yeah. look, and can it's only there? just missed the, the skull. Oh, here, here, yes, yeah. yeah, just there. So that's whoop, where are you? <laughs> that's our third one then. Okay, well, that's great. So you're going to go into that one as well? Yep. Yeah, we're coming up thick and fast now, aren't they? I hope that's a lot. I hope so. As we scraped away the rubble from the graves, we kept a lookout for grave goods. In particular, one of the most common things to be buried with, a knife. But even if we found one, it would have deteriorated with age. We wanted to know what a Saxon knife might have looked like brand new. Ivor Lawton has come to demonstrate traditional Saxon blacksmithing. He begins by building a forge in the earth, into which he'll stack charcoal, just as the Saxons did. By now, the entire site is a hive of activity. Royal Commission surveyors are plotting the whole site onto a digital map, and at the strip of land at the back, the Geophys team are still trying to get the extent of the graveyard. Hello, Claire. I've been avoiding you for the last day because I'm worried I've set you off on something awful. How are you getting on? Uh, well, we're finding that the anomalies we're getting from any possible graves are just being masked by all the rubble oh, here. Yes. Yeah. So, and it's so looking quite here. It's, it's looking quite up here, so we're, we're looking hopeful that if there's anything up here that we'll have a chance of picking them up, but anything that we did yesterday was... So you were down just there completely all yesterday masked. Nothing. Yeah, oh, there's... Wow. there's it's worth a try, I suppose. Yeah. It's... Right, so we can't actually find the graves. We can't find the extent of the cemetery by the geophysics. No. no. I think I'd better go and have a chat to the rest of the team and see how we're going to do that, because that's one of the things we really do need to do, is find out right. how far the cemetery right. goes. OK, then. Bye, Bye. Steve. The solution is to put a trench through the ground at the back of the site to see if we can actually see any graves. 
As this is going on, I've got time to catch up with a pathologist who's come to see our skeletons. Right. When it's in the ground like this, what sort of information can you tell about the body? Well, with what's exposed so far, we can see that this is almost certainly a female. How do you know that? The frontal area of the skull, the, the brow region, is very smooth. Uh, if we look at Mick, for example, he's got yeah, great I'm, big... Yeah, I'm mine are big ones. Great yeah. big yeah. brow ridges, superorbital <laughs> ridges. It's because I'm a Neanderthal, That's really. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't got any at all, because no, I'm a female. You're right. <laughs> and, uh, and it's one of the, the key, and very easy to, to apply, sexing criteria. And presumably it's an adult? Yes, it's an adult, um, and we can tell that because of the size of the skull, for one thing, although that's not always an indicator, because some adults have got very small heads, yeah. and some children have got very it's large very heads. Very big heads, yeah, I know. But like it's because... <laughs> <laughs> and they're getting some teeth and the, the bottom right, jaw yeah. coming yeah. through now. Oh, there's, yeah. the, there's the jaw, bottom jaw coming. The teeth, right, teeth are really them. very, very good. You can tell whether they had a, a hard, gritty diet. So for the Saxon period, we would expect a lot of wear on the teeth, especially the back teeth, yeah. because of the way they produce flour, which ended up with a lot of grit. And that's, yeah. that, and that's just a piece of bone, quite a part of the, part of the rib. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a piece of ossified cartilage. Isn't this right from, up? Right from, up from, this, right. from yeah. this region. Top of the chest. Yeah. yeah. And again, this ossification of cartilage takes place usually in older, older adults. So it, this is all pointing to an old female at it, the moment? At the moment. Um, in, in what is very, a very big and probably important grave. I think my most predominant image of death is those little curtains that close at the crematorium before the thing's whisked away. <laughs> or else one of those big marble angels in the cemetery. But presumably the Saxons didn't have that kind of thing in mind when they were getting buried, did they? I think the thing we've got to remember here is that in the 6th century they were basically pagan. And they continued to be pagan, as far as the West Saxons were concerned, right up until 634, when Birinus converted them. Presumably, because of the grave goods that we've found in various places around here, it implies that they were actually prepared to go off on their journey. And also that these would have been be of use to them uh, after they got there. You know, they'd be feasting round the table with Woden and their ancestors. Uh, they'd be living a similar kind of life to that on Earth, which would uh, require them to use all these things, yeah. If I was about to embark on the long journey to Valhalla, I'd need my car keys, uh, a map, newspaper. I'd take my personal organiser with my RAC card and my credit cards in it. Need my razor, a couple of CDs, a Raikuda one, that would be nice for the journey. Uh, portable telephone, hairbrush, a bit of hairspray, and uh, this is my car radio, or at least the, uh, the front bit that you take off so it doesn't get nicked. I think that just about represents my life. A little bag as well, maybe. And now I can die happily. And a few hundred years later, if anyone finds me, oh, they find a bits and pieces of this and my belt buckle, my metal fly, and my earring. And my glasses. Back at the site, the situations changed dramatically. The trench we dug to find the extent of the graveyard turns up something completely unexpected. I hear you found something in here. Yes, indeed, yes. We've just started Ooh. digging our first sample trench on the other side of this big clay area in the cemetery. And we've hit on two features straight away. Can I jump in? Yes, do, yes, you're OK, OK over there. There's two things. There's this small one here which seems to contain fragments of a pot, and I think that line there is the actual part of the pot. The, the top must have been ploughed right? off. And here, yeah, yes, we've got, we've got a void, and in fact, a look. Oh, a piece of, we've got, I think we've got an inverted pot. Put your hand in there. But it's large, isn't it? Indeed, yeah. That, that, that's, that's at least that as far as this. Sure, isn't it? yeah, yeah. If that's the base, if that's part of the base of the pot, then I think we may actually be looking at, if you imagine, an, inv an inverted pot. In. Yeah. 
So we have got cremations here. Well, I think I think we'll find that this is actually an, an inverted cremation pot of Bronze Age date. Can, can we get a roof over here? Because this is, I think there's rain getting onto this now. It's... What have you got then? I saw you got a trench open. Well, oh, look, look at this. We've got some cremations turned up at last. We put your hand in and mm, feel see in. There's bones or something there's inside. Bone in there. Can we get that roof now, please, as quickly as possible? Definitely the base, though, Mike. It's just the water is it is because it's completely the, the soil's been keeping it solid. There. Yeah, I mean you're going to have to get that out very very carefully, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you look at that. Look, it's called looking into the past. Look, quite literally. <laughs> What we have is a pot filled with the cremated remains of someone who died 2,000 years before the Saxons got here. Our investigation is thrown into prehistory. Down by the river, Phil's collared into helping Ivan produce his Saxon knife. It's a two-man job involving critical timing. When I take it out, stop. Oh, that's okay. a relief. Do I get? I do get time for a breather. Do yeah. I? <laughs> when I take when I take it out of the fire, stop. Stop the. Stop it going. Okay. Right. It's amazing, isn't it, eh? We haven't even going. What? Just a few minutes, really. Yeah. How many bands have you got? That's four there. Four bands there. Yeah, you have alternating bands of steel and iron. Oh right, yeah. so they're, I mean, they might look the same, but they're not the yeah. same. When, when it's polished and etched, you would actually be able to see the, difference, ah. the differences in the metal themselves. So a really, a really big thing, like a sword, would be a, a, a really, a would really be a big status symbol then? Certainly, would do, yeah. It'd be a very expensive item. Um, in today's terms, it would probably be equivalent to um, a small house. No wonder we don't find very many of <laughs> Exactly. It's like being um, buried with your Rolls Royce. Ivers doubled the bar over and must now weld eight separate bands of metal into one. So this is a pretty critical point now, is it? Yep. I think this is going to be success or failure. It's as close as that, is it? Yep. How many goals have we got at it? I think one. One go? That's it. Yeah. So what are you looking at? Well, I mean, you're not just letting me get this hot. No, I'm looking um, to see the right temperature. How do you know? Um, well, it, once you get to the right temperature, the metal starts to sparkle, like yeah. a sparkler. I think it's going. Is that it? Oh, wow. Have we got it? Yeah. We've got it. I think so. Back at the site, they've excavated the third grave, a child's grave. A crouched burial, knees brought up to the chest, probably Bronze Age. The site's looking more and more complicated, and there's more to come. So, what, what the Geophys here? team may not have found well, the extent of the graveyard, but they found an odd shape in the next door field. About two metres wide and stopping abruptly in this position here. The box is here, is 10 by 10 metre grid. So what would that ditch imply, Mick? Well, it could be sort of curving around the area where we've got the big brown area of soil anyway. So it might be some sort of border or something? Well, it could be, either to do with whatever's prehistoric there or, or what's Anglo-Saxon. What strikes me as interesting is we've got this area that we think might be the barrow in the middle, prehistoric barrow. We've now got a possible curving ditch that you would expect around the outside of a barrow, sort of ring ditch. Um, and we've got prehistoric cremations that look likely just within inside that that area and that crouched child skeleton which could could be prehistoric as well i mean it it, it seems to I me mean, it's very indefinite yet obviously Nick but... went <laughs> like that ever soon as you said the word barrow i don't know was that skepticism yeah i'm not convinced it's a barrow yet at all i mean i i this is this is very interesting but i think you know we've got a trench coming through here to see whether the cemetery well, extends yes, in that exactly, direction. Yes, yeah. We're going to put another trench in somewhere to see whether the cemetery mm. extends there. That's well, they'll uh, pick up that if it is a that, ditch. They're right? going to pick this yeah. up, whatever it is. So, I mean, I don't think we should speculate about this yet. Well, that's a bit impressive, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it certainly is. 
gone down a bit further than I thought. Meanwhile, conservationist Meg Brooks is excavating our 3,000-year-old Bronze Age urn. But uh, it's certainly going down here. I think I've just about got to the bottom there. It seems to be a little pattern, or at least some grooves running around the side of it near the bottom. That's right, yes. I think, I think that's the shoulder there where the grooves are, and then it's coming out into a neck and a sort of little outturned rim. So this site could have been a burial site for maybe two, three thousand years? Oh yes, it looks as if it goes right through. People have always uh, lived and, and been buried here, yes. A sacred site. Indeed. As the site's getting complicated, Mick and Carenza take to the air to see if they can make sense of it within the context of the surrounding countryside. Brilliant. Yes, because this, this is a new experience. Yes, here, it is. It? It's fantastic. <laughs> hey, do you see, look, you can see the circle of that. That's that thing that shows up in the air photograph in the field oh, there. Yes, look, see? yes. And oh, you can even see, you can see it lighter and darker yeah. in the middle. Well, I wouldn't have believed that would have shown up. That's very clear, isn't it? That's so really that's the good. barrow we know had the, yeah, the Bronze yeah. Age uh, Can we tip out a bit to get more of this field can, can, in Can view? we move over to the right a bit, Jerry? If you look at the size, actually, at the similarity in size between that, that's showing as a ring ditch now. Yeah. Yes, you see the darker ditch. Yeah. And that's actually a similar size to the sort of curve that's coming around on that bit we're digging, and isn't we, it? We can see the curve on our yeah. site very clearly. It's now, very similar yeah. size, very yeah. similar. And look, that's, that's yeah. showing really yeah. well. As they well. want to compare the size of the barrow in the green field with the brown patch at the back of our site. Uh, we know that it goes under the house with the white van. And when suddenly Carenza spots something new. On the other side, What's that coming up that trench there? Do you see that dark curve? That's another ring ditch there, isn't it? Well, it could be. Well, Don't you see yes, it? The one nearest us, yeah. that trench curving across, they clip the edge of it. It looks like a ring ditch that would have surrounded a barrow. Yeah. I think that looks like a second ring ditch to me. Yeah, well, we'll see what they say back on the ground. We're getting towards the end of day two, and as you can see, the skeletons are really getting uncovered now. And uh, we found some pretty interesting things in it. Over here, this green thing here appears to be a brooch, and there's a pattern or something indented into it there. And here, there's a long pin with some goo or something on it, which may be decayed vegetable matter or something, I don't know. And uh, over here, this is a bead, a glass bead with a hole right through it. Our first grave finds and uh, it's looking pretty good. I think it's been a brilliant day. Yeah, it's <laughs> really exciting. But something weird happened about halfway through the day. At the start of the day, we got this story about a Saxon cemetery, and we've had some fantastic finds. We've got a, a brooch. Oh, great! You've actually had some stuff come out of it now. Yeah, and uh, we're a big behind pin. On all this, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, a bead, large bead. <laughs> None <laughs> of them in my grave. You're not trying, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Phil. But this weird thing happened, which was suddenly we veered off into the into the prehistoric. Mm. Well, there's definitely a prehistoric focus to that cemetery. Need, we yeah. found three completely new unrecorded barrows in that wheat field near the the cemetery site. What's so the guys who earlier on no, were, were saying they're about uh, that they'd seen a ring in their field next door yeah. to our mm. field, that yeah. would That'd be, be right. another barrow. The, the really interesting thing is that the, there are three smallish ones in the field just away from the site. The field nearest the site has got one very large one. It's exactly the same width as the one you're turning up in the trench. So certainly there's a, there's a prehistoric focus. It'd be great, wouldn't it, if by the end of tomorrow we can find out a bit more about the Bronze Age use of the site and a bit more about how the Saxons used Used it and then try and tie in the whole mm. thing so that we can tell a little bit about the story of how this place has been used over what 3,000 yeah. years. God, yeah. fantastic. See what we can do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. should be able to that. that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. I think it would be useful, Pete, if you could um, sort of. Tell us where you think we, we've got to and, right. and quite where we should go in the remaining time that we've right. got. Well, clearly we've got to remove the skeletons. They've now been recorded, or well, the archaeological recording is done. Yeah. There's, there's certainly more um, work on the, the, the clarification of the ring ditch and the prehistoric features at the back of the site. That's sort of cleaning and recording. That's right, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the prehistoric site was a, was a real surprise, really. Great surprise, yeah. Didn't yeah. expect it at all. Yeah. We, we knew there was something 
happening with the density of the graves, you know, where, where they get thinner here. Yeah. And it seems that they are very much respecting a, a focus. But what exactly is the focus of the site? We know our Saxon graveyard looks something like this. Carenza thinks this is a ring ditch surrounding a burial mound or barrow, and we'll put in a new trench here to find the other side of it. There are Bronze Age burials here and here, but what's this dark area at the back of the site? Can we find out exactly what it is and the role it plays here? But first, Victor's making a record of all our skeletons, from which he'll recreate how they looked when they were buried. This is the lady who was buried with a brooch and glass bead. Here's the Bronze Age child. Now we can get on and remove the bones. What we need to do is get right in underneath this bone. And once we do that, then it should lift away quite easily without breaking. You see, sometimes we even find the, the kneecap, and the kneecaps are gone on this one. It's like Paul Gascoigne. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Now, if I give a bit of support for that end as well. There we go. Now, for a bone specialist, obviously, it's the joints which are... Well, because they can tell age and the, disease. The, the, uh, I mean, that's where the, 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 um, any evidence of disease, particularly arthritis, will be stored in there. Um, All the bones will be packed away to be kept in a museum where they can be studied at a later date. We'll also box up the grave goods, the brooch, and the iron pin. The bead turns out to be amber and was probably imported from the Baltic coast. What do you think of that then? That's fantastic. Oh, that's isn't it? the blade that, that Ivor and I made yesterday. I mean, we had all that excitement, that prehistory yesterday, that I yes. didn't actually get much chance to have a look at it yesterday. Ah, is see all these, is see all these twisting? Are? That's yeah, it. That's right. eight bits of metal all twisted together. Yeah and then one blade welded on the side there. And what, that's for one, the one bit for the edge and the other bit for the string? <laughs> it's a pity that we didn't find one of these oh. in one of our graves. Well, we, we might do yet, I suppose, mightn't we? Ironic, a really, because you find so many of them normally. Yeah. By now, the new trench at the back of the site was open and Carenza had found what she was looking for. It was the other side of the ring ditch she'd seen from the helicopter. Going across really nicely like yeah. that. Yeah. More or less exactly as you predicted. It's about half a metre off, I think. Mm. Not bad, though. It, the width of the ditch looks so similar to the one that we could see as the crop mark in the other field. Right. That was what made me so convinced that that, that really was, was a ring ditch. Yeah. In that. I mean, this has confirmed, I think, that we've definitely got prehistoric funerary activity and burials on this site. This is definitely what that is. Right. An hour later, Carenza had made yet another discovery. Helena? Yes? Can you have a look at this a minute? Yes, certainly. I think we might have another urn under here. We've really? got this dark patch yeah. here and how yeah, hollow that yes. is. Yeah. So this, uh, we think we've got another urn here, I think. <laughs> so are we going to start excavating? No, I don't think I don't so. Think so. Um, we haven't really got enough time. And also, I think we should actually leave this in place. Why? Well, really, you've seen how much time and effort it's taking to get those two urns out safely so they can be properly conserved. It's going to take a similar amount of time and effort to get this out. It it could be quite big, like that first one. I mean, this has been in the soil for 4,000 years. At that time, it's, it's got stable now. It's in a situation with the soil packed around it that's keeping it solid. It's in a stable moisture content. As soon as we start to disturb it, 
it's that stability is going to be lost. So the answer is yes. we'll cover it up with earth and mm. leave it for future generations of archaeologists. 50 years time, who knows what sort of techniques archaeologists might have by then to ask and answer questions about what's in that urn that we can't answer now. I have to agree, it seemed the best thing to do. In the meantime, Meg's prepared the Bronze Age urn, ready to be taken to the conservation lab in Salisbury. You got it, mate? Yeah, I'm there. Oh, that ain't too bad. But we still have questions left to answer about the Saxons. On day one, we said we'd try and locate where they might have lived, their settlement. The field by the church has some earthworks, just the remnants of a medieval village. That's what Mick thinks it is. But Carenza's found something which may prove it's Saxon too. I mean, we've come here partly to see if we can't see if this isn't a likely settlement site to go with a cemetery. But I mean, these earthworks to me look more like village earthworks. You know, Medieval these sort village. of sharp corners and mm. nettles and so but, on. Um, I mean, yeah. Nothing obviously Saxon, though. Well, in that case, uh, there's something else we've managed to rustle up from this site. It's lucky, actually, that we've had both a survey and, and an excavation on this site. This and, is uh, the stuff on the sites of monuments record. That's of. right. We've got the pottery, some of the pottery from it, out of Salisbury Museum. I mean, there's, there's pottery here that I think that, that looks perfectly OK for pagan yeah, Saxon stuff. This an incredible stroke of luck. Saxon pottery, which normally never survives in the ground, proves that this was the site of a Saxon settlement. I mean, I think that's really quite good evidence. I mean, it, it may not I look very much, but I mean, oh, no. it's so rare to get anything at all from a medieval village that's site a... that might give you an earlier picture. It's excellent, I'm really pleased. And we've yeah. got the cemetery, and now yeah. we've got the settlement. Yeah, that's great. great. Our finds turn up at the conservation lab. The urn will take months to work on, but we can get started on the grave goods straight away. Oh, I haven't seen these since they've come out of the grave. We can't see much here because there's too much corrosion and chalk all over it. So if I x-ray them, we can see the shape of this pin and we'll also be able to see the, the decorative mm. pattern on the front of this brooch. Mm. Right. Now, you can see that that pin has got a... Ah, yes. Mm. Good. Oh, look at that. Clear as anything Good. inside all yeah. that uh, gunge, isn't it? And that's the brooch. It just seems to have a simple pattern around it, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, you can actually see a series of little stamped dots, can't you? Tiny little ones. Oh, good yeah. Lord, yeah. Cool. Oh, and the one in the middle, maybe. Yeah. Well, that's incredible, isn't it? That really does make the point, doesn't it, about lumps of horrible, corroded, gungy stuff. I've got all the detail inside. Meg will now carefully scrape off the encrusted chalk from the finds, eventually revealing the real object underneath. We now know the brooch was made of a copper alloy, probably bronze, and then gilded. And here it is. The woman who wore it probably wasn't royalty, but she certainly came from a wealthy family. For the last 24 hours or so, we've been speculating that the key to the riddle of this graveyard probably lies in this big, brown, depressed area here. And about five minutes or so ago, we found what may be the answer. There, where that dark shadow is, we found this handful of charred human remains, which represent what was probably the first person ever to be buried here, about, say, three and a half thousand years ago. They were laid here and then covered in flints, and then on top of that, some sort of low barrow was built. And everything else that happened here after that was a direct or indirect consequence of that first person being buried there. So our three days, what's the story? We know that about 3,500 years ago, Bronze Age chieftains buried their people in what we now know was a pond barrow, a burial mound with a concave centre. 
other lower status burials took place around the perimeter. 2,000 years later, the Saxons arrived and built their settlement. When they came to choose a graveyard, they put it here, near the older landmark. But they put very few graves near the base of the barrow, out of respect for an earlier civilization. I think there's just a bit more tidying up to do, a bit of bagging, and that's just about it. Mm. Helena, Helena. Hello. The big question, is David going to be able to build his house now? In the area that we've excavated where the Saxon burials are, I think the answer is yes. It's the areas at the front of the site where there all the rubble is and the concrete, um, and at the area at the back of the site where we've got some archaeology where I think there are going to be a few more problems, um, perhaps we need to look at that area. I mean, he can have his house, but he can't have his front garden and his back garden. Well, I think, I mean, one of the quickest ways... I can't have any water or sewer. <laughs> what we've done in the past on this site about the service is actually, rather than getting just the water board to come along and dig a trench, is to actually take the topsoil off and clear a wider area to see if there are any burials, and then put the trench around the burials if there are any there. You're hedging slightly, but basically you are saying to us, Yes, David can build, aren't you? I think so. I think it's going to be all right in the centre of the site, yeah. <laughs> What's the news then? He can build. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> I mean, it is incredible, isn't it? I think so. If those Saxons all those years ago had not respected the earlier site and thereby left a gap in the middle, you wouldn't be able to do that, probably. Mm. That's amazing. <laughs> We've got a result. We've got a result.